buenas tardes, buenas tardes a todos amigos eh, que nos están viendo a través del Facebook de la Facultad de Ciencias, a través del Facebook del Instituto de Geofísica, a través del Facebook de Ciencias Espaciales UNAM. El día de hoy es un gusto para mí retomar el ciclo de Ciencias Espaciales. Después de unas largas vacaciones regresamos este semestre con eh, cuatro charlas que han sido preparadas con mucho entusiasmo y con mucho gusto para todos ustedes, esperando que eh, podamos llevar un poco un poco más de la visión de las ciencias espaciales, qué hacen, a qué se dedican, etcétera. El día de hoy contamos con la participación de un buen amigo y colaborador, el doctor Olivier Vitas, eh, que nos va a estar hablando sobre la misión Mars Express, eh, entre, otros, entre, entre otros temas. Eh, les recuerdo nada más que eh, la charla, antes de introducir a nuestro, a nuestro eh, presentador del día de hoy, les recuerdo que la charla va a ser dada en inglés, pero que esperamos eh, recibir todas sus preguntas en inglés o en español, no importa, en, eh, eh, en las redes sociales y nosotros haremos cualquier pregunta que tengan, eh, con, eh, se las dirigiremos a, hacia Olivier. Eh, no me queda más entonces que dar la palabra a mi, mi compañero Primoz Kaidish, también otro investigador del Departamento de, Cien de Ciencias Espaciales del Instituto de Geofísica, para dar co comienzo a esta plática. Adelante, primos. Sí, muchas gracias. También para mí es un gran placer tener, tener aquí al doctor Olivier Viltas. Uh, vamos a empezar con una breve introducción. Uh, para esta ocasión preparamos un uh, video uh, que le vamos a compartir ahorita. Físico espacial de profesión, Olivier Vitas es investigador de la Agencia Espacial Europea, ESA por sus siglas en inglés, dedicado a estudiar el universo y comprender lo que pasa más allá de nuestras fronteras terrestres. Es doctor por la Universidad Joseph Fourier, donde obtuvo el grado por la investigación sobre la modelación de la ionósfera de la Tierra y Marte. Desde 2003, Trabaja en la ESA y ha participado en misiones como la Mars Express y ExoMars, que han arrojado importantes descubrimientos sobre la atmósfera y superficie de Marte. También participó en el proyecto hindú Chandrayaan-1, que se situó en la órbita lunar y exploró su superficie. Desde el 2015, el Dr. Vitas es responsable de la misión JUICE, que explorará tres de las cuatro lunas heladas de Júpiter para, entre otros objetivos, evaluar el potencial de los satélites jovianos para albergar vida. El trabajo de Olivier Vitas es un valioso referente para comprender el estado de la investigación espacial y lo que sabemos hasta hoy sobre nuestro sistema solar. Ok. So, Olivier, uh, welcome. Welcome to, to Mexico, virtually. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, accepting our invitation. Um, as you can see from the video, we know already a little bit about you. Uh, we know that you work at European Space Agency. We know that uh, you are a project scientist. You have been in charge of several space missions in the past, and you are in charge now of a future space mission. But maybe we should start in the beginning. So. Um, More or less, everybody knows what NASA is, but uh, I think maybe we could then say a few words. What about ESA, the European Space Agency? Can you, uh, maybe we should say a bit, what is this agency? What is the purpose? What is its purpose and uh, what does it do? Yep. So ESA, the European Space Agency is the, the equivalent of NASA, in fact, but in Europe. So everybody knows uh, knows NASA, so it's close to your to your country, the United States. So Europe is a little bit further away, but you uh, you should be aware that we have a, a big space agency, which is called ESA, so European Space Agency. So we are also dealing with space. Uh, we send satellite to space for telecommunication, for navigation, like the GPS, uh, Galileo. Uh, we build some rocket to go to, to space. They are called Ariane. And actually, they are launched from a, a space which, uh, which is not too far from you in, in Kourou, in French Guiana. Guiana. Uh, we are also dealing with, uh, with a project, scientific project. So we send satellite to space to... Uh, 
to do astrophysics, to uh, to send observatory to observe the the galaxies and the stars. We send also satellites, and it's much much closer to my field. We send satellites to explore the solar system, so Mercury, Mars, Venus, uh, Jupiter, and so on. I, I, I think we will we will discuss about that. So we work a lot with uh, with space. We have a very interesting program, and we can talk about that maybe in much detail later. There is a difference between NASA and ESA because NASA is just from United States, but ESA is a big collaboration, right, in the Europe. How, how many countries are there collaborating there right now? Yes. Yeah, so here, maybe I can. Uh, let's see if I can share my uh, my screen, and let me know if uh, if uh, if you see something. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see it well. Okay. So let me check. So here it's better to explain with a, with a screen. So this is a, this is a view of Europe. And you see most of the countries that are shown here. So you see France here, you see Spain, Portugal, uh, UK, uh, Norway, Sweden, and most of the countries in Europe, in fact, they contribute to, to the European Space Agency. It's a little bit similar as the European Union. So all uh, many countries in Europe are part of the European Union, not, not all of them. And recently we have seen that uh, uh, UK uh, uh, stopped being a part of Europe. Uh, but in any case, we, we work a little bit like Europe. So every country is contributing to the, to the space program of the European Space Agency. So it's a kind of a group of, uh, of countries and we try to work together, of course, in, the, the difference between NASA is that in NASA, they all speak American. So it's uh, maybe easier that it's only one country. Uh, in Europe, we have different countries with different uh, wishes uh, for, for the space program. And we work with different languages, uh, but that's uh, specificities of Europe, which is, uh, which is also quite uh, interesting. We have a lot of diversity. And I think what we do in space is also quite uh, interesting. And compared to NASA, I think it's also great. Yeah. Uh, so how do you convince all these countries to, to participate? How do you convince a country that it, it makes sense to form part of the European Space Agency? What are the benefits? Oh, that's, that's a very good question. So it, it's like uh, Europe. I mean, when we, did, we need to take decisions, so in that case for space applications, so um, what kind of rocket do, you want, do we want to build? What kind of program do we want to build? What kind of satellite do we want to uh, uh, a positioning system in Europe? Do we want to have satellites which, which explore the planet in the solar system? Do, you, do we want to have observatories which observe space, uh, the galaxies and so on? All of that needs dis discussion between uh, all the countries and we need to have an agreement. And like every uh, decision, uh, there, is, there are a lot of discussions and we need to decide uh what do we want to do and then how much uh, money do we want to put in that and of course the main question is what is the benefit of 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 those uh, space programs for europe and for the people and here for example uh, we know that space is very important for example to in the time of the, uh, in the area of telecommunication i mean to watch uh, tv or to have internet uh, to be able to make a phone call we, we need, we need uh, satellites uh, to know where we are, to know your position on, in your car uh, with your TomTom or your GPS system on your watch or on your computer uh, and on many other objects. Now you need satellites in space. So that's a clear benefit. Also for the, for the weather to, to, to forecast the weather. Will it rain tomorrow? Uh, do you need to, to, wear your, to wear your jacket or to, to bring an umbrella tomorrow? It's good to check the weather forecast and that we do, we do that with, uh, with satellites. So we, are clear, we have clear applications which are for the benefit of the people in Europe and in other countries. And also we have more, uh, let's say, uh, dream uh, ideas or applications like uh, to, uh, to know more about uh, life outside uh, Earth uh, or what is the origin of the universe, this kind of question, which is less uh, interesting for the day to day life, of course, but it's a fascinating question. So we are also working in this on those lines. Okay, so every country like uh, contributes to the let's say to the budget of ESA by paying uh, a, a fee or a membership a membership yep. fee basically, yes. And then, so how how big is this budget? 
how much money are we talking about per year? Like, uh... oh, the budget. I mean, if I, uh, it's always difficult to talk to to talk with numbers because when we talk about big numbers, they are uh, difficult to uh, to understand. But I think what is what what would be sim simpler to understand is that the budget that every European uh, give to uh, to the European Space Agency Space Agency every year. It's something like uh, uh, one ticket of movie theater. You mean so per person? Per person. Okay. So every every European uh, give uh, the 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 an amount of equivalent to a ticket of theater, and then with that uh, we do all our space program. So navigation, oh, science, etc. So. At the end, because we have many people, it's a lot of money. It's, it's a few billions of, of euros. But when you think to, uh, to what is represented for each person, at the end, it's not a lot if you compare to, uh, to other expenses in, in Europe. Yes, of course. And I was reading somewhere that uh, it actually benefits economically. Now that the countries benefit from this economically, like every euro they invest in space, comes back like multiplied right yeah yes at, at the end i mean when when the the the, the countries in europe they give uh, some money to the european space agency to do the program in fact we don't keep the money for for ourselves i enjoy it uh, that would be nice but this is not the case so the money in fact we 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 put it again in the european industry so the the companies which okay. build satellites which develop uh, hardware they develop uh, uh, computers to, to put on the on the spacecraft, the cameras, uh, everything that goes to space is built by companies. And then the money is put by this company. For example, we have big companies in France, in Spain, uh, and smaller company. And in fact, companies everywhere in Europe. So that means all these companies, they receive this, uh, this money to, uh, to, uh, to build this, uh, these satellites. And that's if, if the money gets, uh, if the companies, they get the money, then they can employ people, and that's the clear benefit for for the society because that means people can work on very interesting topic. It's sort of to stay to go ahead with the technology and stay in the edge of the technologies also because countries give like public money and the companies bring get it back, multiplied finally, no? But it's like development new technologies, right? Yes, yes, yes. So that means we we uh, we give some budget to be able to people to work, so that's good. And also uh, the way that that we deal with the with the money, so it's not given directly to the to the companies, but it's via the European Space Ag Space Agency, so we can check. Uh, and we can decide which money goes to where. So that means we can also uh, monitor what's going on and we can make some competition to make sure that the companies, they do their best. They're, not, they're just not receiving money to receive money, but they have to, to show that they can build a great system and they can do their best. So it's also a way to stimulate uh, the creativity. And so that's good for, for everybody, I think. Diana, I, I think you have a question. Yeah, I have a question because uh, Oliver, just a couple of minutes ago, you, you mentioned uh, this uh, relationship between the ESA and all the industry and corporatives that are um, involved in the building, actually in the building of, of the missions and the different projects, satellites, um, et cetera. But, and that's an um, interesting point that we maybe you have some more, more words on it because right now most of, of our audience are students, uh, bachelor mm -hmm. students who are maybe planning to go into um, the research field. But there is also another, this is another field that um, besides this ideal uh, scenario of people just doing research, ISA is not just research. ISA is much more than that, as you mentioned. And maybe you can uh, give a glimpse to, to the students about how is uh, how intimate is this relationship between the industry and the research activity uh, at ISA. So, in fact, at ISA we don't do we don't do really any any research or technology development, it's mainly done in Europe with the companies and the research activities that are done by the laboratories in Europe. For example, like the university in Mexico, we have many universities everywhere in, in Europe. So uh, Paris, uh, Madrid, uh, uh, etc. cetera, all, all the big cities and smaller cities, we have many research laboratories and university. And we have all the students there doing their research and uh, junior scientists and senior scientists. And uh, 
the people doing research, they work also in close relationship with the companies uh, doing technology development. So that's uh, that's how we are interlinked. And the link, the link with the European Space Agency and that we allow to have a space program in Europe. So many things, as I said, uh, we built a rocket, uh, we built a spacecraft. And then depending on the topic, the research activity could be, uh, could be done in a certain direction or the companies, they can build also satellite for a certain application, like for example, TV satellite. But in the European Space Agency, we don't do necessarily research or, or development of technology, but we make sure that these are done in Europe. Yeah, I, I imagine that it's quite um, hard to, to combine doing research that you already need a lot of time just for doing research. And uh, in addition to that, um, be able to uh, take care of the missions, the projects, the, con the concepts of the mission and uh, all that stuff. So in, in that sense, um, we will ask to, we would like to ask you about your role at ESA. So you are a project scientist. Maybe you can explain to the audience what is a project scientist? What, what are your responsibilities? What is your, your what are your main work being yeah, a so, scientist? Uh, so in my field, I am working as a, as a scientist uh, in the science mission. So that means I am dealing with a satellite with no uh, direct application for for the day-to-day -day life like uh, GPS or this kind of thing. So we are we are building satellite to explore the solar system uh, with the idea to know more about uh, Mars, Venus, uh, Mercury, all the planets to understand better the solar system to see how it evolves with time if there is life uh, outside Earth. These kind of big questions. So and for every project, for example, if we build one satellite to go to Mars, for example. For every project, there is a scientist uh, who is responsible for, for the science that is done with this satellite. And in, if we take an example of Mars Express, which was, which, which was launched in 2003, and it's still in orbit around Mars, I was the project scientist for Mars Express for six years, six, seven years. And then in this role, I was, uh, I was checking that the science is done, that we were, were doing the observations that we wanted to do. For example, take an image of the volcano. There was in the movie, some images of volcano at Mars. So uh, my role was to make sure that we could image the volcanoes. We take images uh, at the proper time. So for example, we want to take an image when it's uh, the day on, on Mars, not is when it's the night, otherwise the images, we don't see anything. So we do, this is what we call the planning of the observations. And then my role is to make sure that the data or the images when they are taken by the spacecraft, they are, uh, they are sent to Earth. And then the, the images are sent to the laboratories and to the student, we were talking about students, to the students that are analyzing the data on their computer at, uh, at the university. And then people can make science and we can make a great uh, discovery. So. Uh, my work as project scientist is to make sure that when we have a mission to a certain planet, uh, then we do the science. So the scientists are happy with the data and they do great discoveries. And then what is also very important is that the general public, so you or other people, they know what's going on and they can see their pictures also on the TV or on their computer, on the internet. And they can also understand what we are doing and uh, understanding the, 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 the progress in, in science. Okay, so, um, so, so yeah, go ahead, Primoz. Sorry. So basically, you are a sort of coordinating, right? Uh, you you have to coordinate uh, all the scientific effort uh, from the beginning to the mission till the end of the mission, right? So yeah. So here I, I have a, I have an example. Do you see this uh, image? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we do. So you, you have, you have, I have seen that you have shown that in the in the movie in the in the introduction, which, so, which was quite nice, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. So that's uh, an image of the biggest uh, canyon in the solar system, so much bigger than the Grand Canyon in the United States. So uh, that's it is called Valles Marineris. It's uh, on the surface of Mars. So from here to here, basically, you have the uh, the country of Italy. So you see, it's, okay. the, it's, it's a canyon uh, big like Italy, so three, 4,000 of kilometers. And the height here is exaggerated, it's, it's 10 kilometers, but we have, we have changed a little bit the scale to be able to see the height. So it's uh, 4,000 kilometers long 
and 10 kilometers high. So it's a big canyon. And when so how live, many big, okay. So how many Grand Canyons could you fit in it? Do you know? Yeah, well, I think, I think easily is three or four here. Okay. So that, that's really the biggest, uh, the biggest canyon in the, in the solar system. So it's uh, quite an interesting uh, area. So we try to understand the geology, how it, why it's there, what, what, what this can tell us about the history of, of Mars as a planet. Uh, but what I wanted to tell you here is that when, if we take a picture with, with our spacecraft, the picture will be a little square here. If we take another one, it's another square, another one, another small square here. So that means to do, and then we put the pictures together to make this what we call a mosaic. But to do this picture, it takes three or four years because we take a picture at every orbit. And uh, as I said, we need to take picture when it's the, during the day because sometimes we are doing the night. So we need to, have to, to take the picture when we are above a certain area on Mars uh, with the right illumination and we, we don't want to have any clouds. And sometimes we can take any picture because we do another observation with another instrument and so on. So my, my role is to coordinate uh, the observation such that after a few years, we can have all the images ready to make such a picture. And I'm doing that for all the, the objective of the mission. So here it's to take picture, but we do that also. We have instrument to measure the atmospheric properties, uh, the cloud. We have uh, instrument to measure what we call the space environment. So the, the energetic particles that Primoz, you, you know very well. Uh, we have also, um, uh, we, we take also pictures of one of the moon of Mars, which is called Phobos. I can show you later what we did with that. So my, my, my role is really to coordinate the observation to make sure that we got everything we want. And then that we can take, do some science because with these images, people doing geology, they do a lot of science. They explain why do we see, did we have water in the past here? How this, this canyon was formed, etc. So we do some science. And then also for people here in the room, it's good also to see these pictures, just to enjoy some uh, nice images. And we do that for all aspects of the mission. So the surface, the atmosphere, the space environment, uh, the Martian moons, and so on. So how was this canyon formed? So yeah, so here, of course, because we only see the image now, it's very difficult to go back in the past and to, uh, to uh, I mean, to, to, to understand what's going on, for example, 4 billion years ago. So we, we have just to invent uh, the past based on what we see now. And here, what we think is that uh, there have been some, uh, some ice in the, in, in the, on the, close to the surface of Mars in the past, because in the past, the climate of Mars was really different. We think there was an atmosphere, uh, not like today, so a little bit like the Earth, there, was, there were some clouds. So there were also some, uh, some water on the surface of Mars at some point, and there were some ice also. Uh, at some point, the ice uh, melted and uh, in one big block, and uh, due also to the volcanic activities, which is not too far from this picture, we cannot see here, but here, here, and here, there are some big volcanoes. So the volcanic activities was very intense on Mars a very long time ago. And uh, so there were some volcanic activities, there were some water, there were some ice, and then there were some big collapse that uh, basically the, the canyon was formed uh, because of that. But this is what we think. Uh, uh, based on what we see now. Um, so, yeah. Diana, yeah, no, so, you have a question. Yeah, we, we already have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. And um, the first why it says for missions, uh, for mission like these, these ones to, to Mars, uh, Mars Express uh, on ExoMars, are ESA and NASA uh, working together as a team or um, some people are, asking about these collaborations between ESA and NASA. Oh yeah, no, usually the, the I mean, most of the time I would say um, the collaborations with the, with the different space agencies look. So for example, ESA and NASA, but that's also, we have the big space agency in, in Japan or in India or with Russia. Uh, most of the time it goes very, very well. So we are not fighting each other. I mean, when we deal with space, we know we want to learn uh, as much as possible about the solar system and space in general. 
So there is, of course, a little bit of competition with when we have some, uh, some program that goes to the same planet. So for example, Mars, uh, we collaborate all the time, in fact. So uh, uh, usually it's going very, very well. So for example, at Mars at the moment, we have something like three or four uh, orbiters orbiting Mars. So we have two from, uh, from Europe. In fact, we have more than that. We have two from Europe. We have uh, two from uh, NASA. We have one from uh, from India. We have one from the Emirates. We have one from Chinese, from China. And on the surface of Mars, we have uh, two rovers operating from NASA and one, uh, one lander and one lander from China. So you see, we have many, many missions. And we collaborate, for example, sometimes the data from, from one of the US rover, the American rover, they are sent to a European orbiter and then the data is sent back to Earth. So there is a lot of good collaboration. Uh, it, will, it will be a bit stupid not to, to fight and to, to be in competition. So we, usually it's very, I mean, usually all in all, there is a very good collaboration between the, the space agencies. Okay, and in in particularly for ESA, uh, some people is uh, are asking uh, which mission is the most important uh, for ESA nowadays. Which, which which one is the project like, the most important? Oh, project? I, I I would not say there is one more important than uh, another. I mean, all we have all kind of interesting projects. So is it will be a little bit difficult for me to say which one is more important. If you ask one person, you will get one answer. If you ask <laughs> another one, you will get another answer. For example, for me at the moment, I am I am working for a mission which is called JUICE. It's the Jupiter Ice Moon Explorer mission. It will launch next year. It will go to Jupiter to, to study the liquid water inside the, the, the Galilean moons of Jupiter, like Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So because it's my project, uh, I will tempt it to say that it's the best project, but it's not. A, <laughs> it will yeah. not be a fair answer. I think we have we have a lot of very interesting projects. All all are very interesting. I have to say. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's elaborating. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Do you yeah. Have another it, question. Yeah, in the, in the same in, in in the same sense of this uh, of this topic. So, um, Stephanie is asking, how do you decide which project to prioritize? Yeah, so that's, uh, so if I talk about in my area, so the scientific uh, missions like Mars Express or the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. So what we do is that we have, we have um, with the European countries, we have a certain amount of budget to do some science. So every year, and with this budget, we decide to uh, at ESA to make small mission or medium mission or big mission. So that depends on the budget and, and our, our schedule. And once we are ready to, uh, to start a new mission, uh, for example, a big mission, what we do is we, we send a call, an open call on the website, uh, open to, uh, to all European uh, researchers. And we tell them, uh, please, we have a certain amount of budget to do a mission. Please send us the, all your ideas and we will evaluate the ideas and we will select the best mission. So what happened is that we, we, we give a few months, typically uh, six months, to uh, for the researcher to to think about their best mission. For example, they want to go to Mars. They say we want to uh, to auto to understand the formation of this uh, of this big canyon. So we need an orbiter on Mars, or we need a rover, uh, or we need to go to Venus to observe the clouds at Venus, or we need to go to Jupiter, or to Pluto, to the to the to to explore the Sun, etc., etc. So we receive all the all the ideas, and then we we, we evaluate the ideas. We get uh, the advices from experts who can tell us mm, what what do we think about that. And then we, at the end, it takes it takes a few years, and we make the selection. So it's a competitive process, and we we try to select the best uh, mission. So that's that's how we select the the mission. So based on the based on the the science. Does the mission very is, is interesting for science? So does, does it bring good question to, to answer? And is the mission possible to make? Because sometimes people propose a mission that uh, is impossible to make. For example, uh, if someone at the moment proposed to, uh, to send a submarine to explore the ocean inside the Europa moon, it, the answer will be at the moment, we cannot do that. And then the third, okay. the third element to consider is, is this mission uh, possible within the budget? 
because we have at the end uh, it's a question of money so if you have one billion to make a, a, a mission if you propose a mission it has to fit within this budget if the mission costs two million we say ah, sorry we cannot make it so so for example you mentioned already the small mission medium-sized missions and large missions and you said about the budget so what is the budget for each type of the mission so how much is for small versus big? so um a big mission it's typically one one billion of euros but you have to think that it's a lot of money, but it's spread over over 20, 20 or thirty years. Huh? So, in uh, if it would be so from the idea, from the call, yes, from yeah, the yes. call, like mission is accepted to when it's realized, there can exactly. be twenty years. Okay. Yes, for example, in the case of of the the mission I am I am dealing with, so the the Jupiter mission, uh, the call was was sent. Uh, so the, it's a budget of uh, one billion more or less 1 billion of euros so it's more or less 1 billion of 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 american dollars also i don't know how it will be in, in mexican uh, <laughs> uh, but in dollars pesos. It's, uh, in pesos <laughs> but it's a uh, 1 1 billion of dollars uh, and the call was uh, was sent in 2007 and the mission will uh, will finish in 2035 36 so it's it's uh, more or less 30 years for this mission so you 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 can see the the duration of a mission when we work for planetary mission or even for astronomical mission like like the hubble space telescope the hubble space telescope is is in space for the last 20 years so we spend yeah. a lot of money but spread over many many years so at the end if you, if you divide by the number of years it's not a lot of money per year but so for the big mission it's a 1 billion of of of, of euros for the medium medium mission it's half of that so 500 600 millions and then you have smaller mission, like it can be 150, 200 million. So that's basic, more or less the three, uh, the three uh, big classes of missions. This money is actually distributed, right? So you, you, this, this. So it sounds like we we have so much money and we spend it on a mission. But what does what does the spending mean? You give it to research institutes, you give it to companies, right? That's yes, so, so the, the the budget is spent in different ways. First, we uh, it's spent in the as we said in the begin in the beginning in the, in the companies in Europe or industry that built the the spacecraft and all the elements to make sure that we have a spacecraft. So all the units inside the spacecraft, the solar panels, and so on. Uh, there is some money which goes to the institute to build the the labora the um, uh, the cameras that we put on the spacecraft or all the uh, the instrument that we put on the spacecraft and that that's mainly made by the european laboratories sometimes with the help of the industry so again the companies in industry they get some money we keep a little bit of money in isa to uh, to operate the spacecraft to uh, but to command it and for people like me also to be part of the of the project so we keep a little bit for us and we give also a, a big part to the to the company which built the rocket because we need to uh, to send the, the spacecraft into space so we need a big uh, rocket like ariane 5 or another rocket uh, like soyuz or and, and, depends of the uh, size so we we give money to uh, to a bit of uh, different uh, group of of people okay and once the mission is finished right i mean uh, nowadays i think they must uh, I mean, once the, it's finished, it doesn't operate anymore. It's still not finished, really, right? You have to maintain some kind of archive of the, da yeah, so of once the, the data. Uh, yeah, yeah, so once the mission is finished, so that depends on what is the end of a mission. For example, uh, uh, in the case of Earth uh, orbiting missions, sometimes we, we bring back the satellite to the atmosphere and it, in the satellite burns in the atmosphere. So that can be an end of a mission. If it's a mission around Mars, which ends uh, because the spacecraft does not work, the, the, the spacecraft is in orbit around Mars forever. Uh, but uh, so when we have no 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 access anymore to the to the spacecraft, uh, what we need to be, make sure is that all the information and all the data, all the images uh, that were taken from the spacecraft, they are on Earth in our computer. And they are in the archive, uh, which is available for everybody, so the scientists, but also anybody like the, the public, if they want to, to have access to all the images, they can go into our archive. So yes, at the end, we, we make sure that all the data is available for, for everybody. So that's very important for us. Okay. So I yeah. think Diana has some more questions from the audience. 
Yes, we have some more questions and uh, it's related exactly with the research uh, field. So um, is there any specific field in which ESA has advanced more or done more research than other agencies? And in that sense, which would you say is ESA's speciality? Uh, that's a good question. I have to say, uh... I don't know because I really don't see the uh, what we do as a, as a competition with uh, with the other. Or I think we try to advance as much as possible and that we progress and we collaborate with the other. So uh, I never thought in which field we are we are better. I, but if if I can think about it, what I could say at the moment is that we have uh, we have many missions in 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 space and in preparation for for exoplanet because exoplanet that's really a very interesting topic uh, since we have discovered a planet outside our solar system it's a very exciting field because that means if we have if there are other planets uh, they can be uh, maybe life somewhere else so that's that's a very interesting field of research and we have a, a various series of uh, of missions to uh, to study exoplanets so to detect them to characterize them and even to to study the atmosphere now so uh, so I think uh, at the moment in the in the area of uh, of exoplanet I would say uh, we are quite uh, quite advanced uh, also at, at Mars I think uh, with our two missions so one which is called Mars Express and one which is called uh, ExoMars I think we are really advanced for example we are the one uh, discovering that in the past there were liquid water on the surface of Mars, and we were the first one to uh, to discover that. And uh, I mean, it, we can give credit to the to the European mission and to the European scientists to uh, to have done that. Uh, but other than that, I really don't don't think about competition and who is the best. So uh, I would need to think a little a little bit more about that. <laughs> yeah, of course. And uh, yeah, from from the point of view of some people uh, doing research, we would think that, yeah, probably planetary missions are um, uh, among the, the most important at ESA. And for instance, Mars Express. And regarding Mars Express, we have a, a, a question uh, here in the chat. Are geophysical methods being used for this mission? I guess that they refer to this mapping of the surface. And if the answer is affirmative, what are these um, methods? Do you know about it? Oh, we are we are really the we have a, a great team of of uh, geologists, uh, so they use uh, all the tools to really study the the images in detail. So what is important is to make sure that we know where the image is taken on the surface of Mars with the right uh, information as a latitude, longitude, altitude, to make sure you do the proper geology. So we have a lot of tools. Uh, I would say to, to synchronize and to, um, to localize the, the data. So that's the thing that it is done. We have also some, a lot of tools in, uh, in the area of uh, radar, radar sounding. So in particular in Italy, we have, uh, we have a lot of teams uh, dealing with that. So uh, the techniques to, uh, to analyze radar data is uh, quite complex based on Earth's uh, ice radar, like uh, being used in Antarctica or on the North Polar Cap. So we have also a lot of uh, of tools uh, used for that. We have also some uh, some some uh, tool to uh, to analyze the data coming from the interior of uh, of Mars. So mapping the gravity field uh, with spacecraft data. Here it's a quite a complicated field. With we have a lot, a lot of expertise in Europe. So we see that this field of research is is very rich. And I think we use the up-to-date uh, tools, uh, mainly developed first for the Earth and apply to, uh, to Mars. Oh, okay. So now we, we have more questions uh, regarding Mars. Apparently this is like the big topic uh, today uh, in, in, in the questions. Um, so first of all, some congratulations on the Facebook for the talk. And it's uh, quite interesting for many of our audience according to their comments. Uh, regarding the, the the next phase of ExoMars, the second phase of this mission uh, that it's uh, scheduled for the next year, 2020, 2022, is yep. there any changes re uh, regarding their, their main objectives? I mean, the, 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 con the mission, the concept mission, is there any, any changes for- No, 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 we can, <coughs> sorry. 
No, the, the mission is a, is a set to launch next year in, uh, in September from, uh, from Russia. And because the mission is, is almost ready for launch, we cannot uh, change the mission uh, just before launch. It, it, it takes so many, so many years, uh, 10, 15 years to develop. So once we are ready for launch, we don't change anything. So the mission is, uh, is still due to launch next year. It will, uh, it will take a few months to travel from Earth to Mars. Then it will land on Mars with the parachute. And then it's a rover that will travel on the surface of Mars with a, and the goal is to search for signs of life. Uh, in particular, there will be a drill that will uh, explore the surface uh, or the below the surface with a, with a drill of two meters. So we will drill two meters down to the surface to see if we find some interesting uh, material. Uh, and the goal is to find some signs of life or signs of past uh, past life on Mars. So the, the goals is not uh, are not changed. And we look forward to the to the mission. We are very excited by that. And uh, like you, when you uh, just arrived to the agency, you worked first in the Huygens mission, right? You yep. were, and then uh, this module that uh, landed on Titan on the yep. Saturn's moon. There yep. are liquids there, so also water, not pure water, but oh, there is water. There's water on Mars. Now you are in charge of juice. There is water on Jupiter's moons, and there seems to be water everywhere. Chance for a life everywhere. But <laughs> maybe you spent most of your time until now uh, with missions on Mars. Maybe um, you could tell us a little bit which are the discoveries or things that maybe uh, because you also have some nice uh, images with you. Uh, which would you say like these most uh, shocking discoveries that we found at Mars? Yes, let's see. So one, one I mentioned a discovery which I, I mentioned is is this one that by analyzing the the data as we see now. Uh, we were able to go back in the past. For example, we, with what, and I think it's very fascinating to think that when you see all the images on Mars, you, you analyze what you see, and then you can, uh, for example, try to imagine what Mars looked like 4 billion years ago, which is very far away in the, in the past. And here, this is an image that we, uh, for example, it's, it's an artistic image, but that could be the image of Mars 4 billion years ago. So you see, uh, all the craters, as we see now, but we see a lot of blue part, which are liquid water. And I think it's quite fascinating yeah. to, uh, to go back in the past and to, uh, to see how Mars look like. So I think one of the main, uh, uh, one of the main discovery uh, that were done in, in the last 10, 20 or uh, of 30 years is that uh, we see the, the planet as they are now, so we, we, we talk about Mars today, but it, we, can, we can speak similarly to Venus or other planets or other bodies in the solar system. But what we see the solar system now is not the one which was yesterday or 1 billion years ago, 2 billion years ago, or at the beginning of the solar system. And I think it's very important when I realize that it really makes something think about very uh, special because the, what we have learned is that the planet and the solar system change with time. We call that evolution. Mm -hmm. So when the solar, the solar system was born with the sun and the stars, the, um, the sun, sorry, the, the planets and the moon, uh, then it evolved. And now we see how, how it is now. But at the beginning, it was really different. And that means in the future, it will be also different. So that's quite very interesting to, uh, to think about it. And this evolution, also can explain why uh, life started on the Earth, why uh, we have no life on Venus, and why maybe there is life on Mars, or why maybe there was life on Mars and that the life stopped. And I think it's quite a so, fascinating question. So in the beginning, the red planet was blue planet, as in exactly. At the beginning, <laughs> uh, it, it was a, we had another blue planet, and we also think that Venus could have been also a blue planet. Okay, so yeah. what happened to, because now uh, there are photos of Mars Express and, you know, of all these uh, channels that were basically river for rivers, right? And uh, the evidences of uh, lakes and seas yeah. and everything. So why isn't there water now? Or like, why is the climate so different now with Mars? Yeah, it's because another example of, of climate change is this, this image. So that's on the left, you have an image on Mars. So that's uh, next to one of the big volcano, which is called Olympus Mons. So here you have to imagine is the flank of a volcano. 
Here it's an image on, on Earth, Antarctica. So you see a glacier here, so okay. ice, uh, ice. And you see it's very similar to the, to the image on the left, which is on Mars. So by analogy, we can say that there were also glaciers like in Antarctica on Mars, but they are not there anymore. Uh, so, but we see just the, the footprint or the imprint of, uh, of glaciers in the past. So that means that the climate has changed. So in the past is really different from now. It's like a climate change on the Earth, and we have the same climate. Uh, we have also climate changes on Mars. So why do, does the, the climate change also on Mars? It's because Mars, again, it's uh, I don't want to say it's imagination, but it's something that we cannot uh, we cannot see now. But we have to uh, to uh, to to invent based on on the data that we see now. And what we think is that because Mars uh, is, a, is a small planet compared to the Earth, uh, it did not evolve the same way as on Earth. So for example, a small planet will be less active in terms of uh, volcanic activities, geologic activities, uh, less heat inside, inside the planet. So that's changed uh, the, the atmosphere as well. Uh, and be also because the planet is pretty small, it cannot keep the atmosphere around the planet. So if we had the denser okay. atmosphere at Mars in the past, because of Mars is a very light planet, the atmosphere uh, went to space. Uh, we have also other explanations like the link with the magnetic field, but maybe it's too complex to explain here. But all in all, we, we, we understand more or less why uh, Mars has uh, evolved very differently from, uh, from Earth. It's, and the main reason is the, because Mars is much smaller and also a little, a little bit further away from the sun compared to, uh, to the Earth. But let's just be, uh, make something clear. The, the, the liquid water today at Mars is a reality, right? But, right? but where is it then? Uh, uh, because I think that there have been some of the discoveries on the surface, but also not on subsurface. And do you think this would be like a, an opportunity for life to thrive in this? So now, so where, so uh, let me check. Yes, so now we don't have this image anymore. So where the liquid water is. So first, uh, because Mars is a small, uh, most of the liquid water, which is also in the atmosphere in terms of water vapor, is lost or was lost into space. We, we call that the, the atmospheric escape. So that one thing, the liquid, the liquid water or the water went into space. So that's one aspect. Then uh, we were thinking that the, the water was uh, trapped uh, inside uh, the planet. Because, at, because now of, of the little atmosphere around Mars, it's not possible to have liquid water stable on the surface. So this image is not possible anymore. But uh, we were thinking that the, the liquid water could be present inside the surface. So that's why we sent two radars on two missions, one from NASA and one from ESAT, with the goal of uh, looking for this liquid water. It's almost failed. In fact, we didn't find any big amount of liquid water or any clear uh, sign of liquid water inside the surface for many, many, many years. The only thing that was uh, recently advertised, maybe two years ago, is that uh, the Mars Express radar finds some uh, possible, possible evidence of uh, subsurface lake, in particular in the South Pole at Mars. So that's something relatively new, and uh, we still need to, to confirm this idea. It's a little bit like the Vostok Lake on the Nice Antarctica. You may have heard about it. So there is a lake uh, four or five kilometers underneath the, the, the surface in Antarctica. It's a very interesting because people would like to understand what can we find in this lake. So we have similar, possibly similar lakes at Mars, but not in a huge quantity. So it's still a, a debate where the liquid water went. And uh, my opinion is that it, it possibly, uh, most likely it went into space due to uh, atmospheric escape. Okay. Yeah, Diana? Yeah, so people are quite interested about this uh, discovery of water uh, at Mars. And the main interest comes in the sense of, of life in another planet, right? The, this is like a very um, common hmm. idea of, yeah, if we find water, is there is a high chance of, of having a life or to sustain human life as, as, we, are, as, as, as we know it. So we have these questions. Uh, this mission represents an important step for the discovery of seeing if there is a possibility of humans living in Mars. 
If so, what advantages and disadvantages has the mission revealed from your point of view? Uh, I'm not sure I understand fully the, fully, fully the question, but um, so what we have discovered is that there were water on Mars, but in the past. Huh? So I think that's important to know, not now, in the past. So that means, what does that mean for life? Is that in the past, uh, maybe life has started on the surface of Mars, like, like life has started on the surface of the Earth on, in the ocean. We know that on Earth, life started on, in the ocean. So that's pretty clear. So that means uh, since there were also liquid water in possibly important quantity like we see on this, uh, on this artistic image, that means it's, it's a possibility. Of course, we'll never know uh, because we are not there four billion years ago, but uh, there is the, the possibility that life started at the surface of Mars. And, and then when, once the water disappeared, maybe life has uh, stopped. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we send the, the ExoMars rover that we were mentioning a few minutes ago, is to find evidence of uh, past life. So I mean, that's life that started and then it stopped because Mars was not a, a good planet uh, uh, to have life like on Earth. So that's, I think, the main, uh, the main discovery. And that's uh, why all the missions to Mars, we try to understand if, uh, if life has started. It's like the, the Mars sample return uh, program from NASA and ESA. We would like also to bring back some rocks from, Earth, uh, from Mars to Earth to analyze in laboratories to have better analysis in, in big laboratories in, in, uh, on, on Earth to see if we, uh, if we can understand better the, the past of Mars and to see uh, if life could have started. So that's a very important question. Of course, there is also the question, do we have a current life on Mars? Uh, so far, we failed uh, finding uh, signs of life, uh, human, uh, microbe, whatever, but that's uh, uh, another big question. Yeah, and uh, again, regarding this, this uh, uh, questions about life in Mars. Uh, so we have something more here. Are there any other promising missions planned with an astrobiology objectives. So I think that this, as this question goes in the, in the way of, because you already mentioned the evolution of, of, the, of Mars atmosphere and how this has changed through, uh, through time. So is there another mission that maybe is planning to do so? Yeah, yes. So that's this one. So this is the a mission I like very much. It's my current mission, <laughs> which is called JUICE for Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. And here, so this is a, a, a we are drawing. So you see Jupiter in the middle, so the biggest planet in the solar system. And you have around Jupiter, you have four very interesting moons. You have Io, Europa, Ganymede, and further away, we have even Callisto, which is not um, mentioned here. And what is interesting is that inside the Europa and Ganymede in particular, uh, at least we know there is liquid water. So at, for Mars, now there is no liquid water and, anymore on the surface. Uh, but at least uh, in the in these big moons around Jupiter, there is liquid water. We know we have found it with the other missions. And since we know that liquid water is a very important ingredient for life, uh, the next step is to understand better the properties of this liquid water. How, how much do we have uh, in terms of water? Uh, what is the composition? Do we have salt in the water? Do we have minerals? How deep is the water underneath the crust? Do we have, is it 40 kilometers underneath the surface or 100? How big it is? Just to understand whether this liquid water could be an interesting place to, for life. So that's why we, we, we send the spacecraft, which is called JUICE, uh, next year, and it will arrive in 2031 in the Jupiter system. And we have a lot of uh, measurement to, uh, to understand better the properties of this liquid water. And that's a very important question. And so in terms of astrobiology, it's a, it's a very important uh, mission. And we work in collaboration with NASA. NASA will send a dedicated uh, orbiter to, uh, to Europa, so the moon here. And with our own satellite, we are mainly interested in Ganymede. So uh, NASA will focus on Europa, we'll focus on Ganymede. So we'll study two very interesting uh, moons that we call the Galilean moons. Uh, to understand better uh, uh, astrobiology question uh, around, around uh, Jupiter. So before we saw that Mars was the most interesting planet to study life and astrobiology. And now 
uh, we think that we need to go to the to the moons of Jupiter and also later to the moons of Saturn because we have also liquid water inside the moon of Saturn. So before the focus was on Mars, it's still Mars, but now we, we also want to study uh, other bodies like the, the moon around the big planet. So, so maybe a question here, like uh, two things for the audience. Is this like, do you expect to find liquid water that's like the same as here? Like, could we drink it? Or is it like a, has uh, other substances in it? And the, the second one is, why do these moons even contain water? They're so far away from sun. It must be very yeah. cold there. So what's yeah. going on? So in terms of taste, um, uh, we will see, I mean, uh, 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 emissions maybe in 100 years from now will be to send uh, uh, maybe a submarine and to, uh, to 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 get more information on how it a test. What we know uh, at the moment is that it does not test very good because uh, there is a lot of salt in it. We know it's very salty, so it's a little bit like maybe it's good for. It's like a, how do you call this? You put salt in your. In your alcohol, how is it called? I forgot. In uh, in uh, Mexico, sometimes you you put, you like to put a oh, lot of the, salt. Uh, michelada. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe. So it's it's a very salty uh, salty drink, and we know it because we have detected the this liquid water with a, a magnetometer, so okay. with magnetic field, and that was the, the that means the principle of detection is that the liquid water is not pure. Otherwise, if, if, if it will be pure liquid water, like you put in your ironing machine or in, in your car, uh, we'll, we will not detect it with the magnetometer. But if the water is salty, and with the presence of the big magnetic field of Jupiter, there is a, a, a very strange uh, uh, physical processes that we call the magnetic induction. Uh, it's too complex to explain, but that means because the, the liquid is contains salt, and because we have the magnetic field of Jupiter, then we can detect the liquid water inside the moons of Jupiter. Okay. So we know the 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 the, the liquid is uh, is is uh, salty. So that's so if one... it's salty, that brings down its melting point. Like this... yeah, also also also. So, so and why is it there? Why is so, it? Why so it's why, not frozen? So, yeah. yeah. So that's your your second question. Uh, and that's a very good question and it's very interesting from the physical point of view. So first, we know that at this distance from the sun. So the, the big planet like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, uh, they are the giant planet they, they form with the with gas, but around the giant planet, because we are far from the sun, uh, we have what we call icy, icy world, icy moons, because there is a lot of ice, because we are far from the sun, so we cannot have liquid water. So, and that's why we call those moons uh, the icy moons, because they are made of ice. So that's I, I think that is relatively clear. So now why do we have uh, liquid water? inside those moons. So why this ice uh, melts inside the moon? And here we have two, uh, two, two processes which can uh, explain why we have that. First, uh, those moons they are a little bit like planets. So they, they have also a bit of rocks inside. And the rocks contain some, uh, some components which are radioactive, like on Earth. We have some radioactivity inside the Earth. That's why the Earth is heated, and we are happy to have a bit of heat. <laughs> and that's why the plant, the, the Earth is active also. So we have some radioactivity, radioactivity inside the, the moons, which heat the ice. And to melt, you need a little bit of heat. So that's one process. And another process, which is very important, and that uh, explains why it happens around a big planet like Jupiter or Saturn, is that the because of the big gravity field of Jupiter, when the moon uh, orbit around Jupiter, they, are, they, they don't keep their, uh, their, their spherical uh, uh, shape. They, we have some tides uh, between Jupiter and the moon because of the big gravity. And as a result, the moon is oscillating like a rugby uh, balloon. Mm -hmm. And that means the, the moon uh, inside, there are some movement of the moon. And if you have movement or friction, you have some heating. Okay. And, the, and the closer you are, you are from Jupiter, the, the bigger the effect. So for example, in the case of Io, which is the closer big moon to Jupiter, we have so much uh, friction and heating that the moon is completely volcanic. Oh, <laughs> so okay. we have, you have the biggest uh, volcanoes in the, in the solar system, the biggest uh, volcanic activity. It's on Io, in fact, it's not on Earth. Okay. 
So it's so hot inside that it, the inside yeah. melts and you have volcanoes. Yeah, yeah. In the case of Io, so for the okay. other, Europa, Ganymede, they are much further away. You have no okay. volcanoes, but the ice melts and then you have the liquid water. So that okay. explain explain the presence of uh, of water. Okay, Diana. Yeah, so in terms of the missions, there is another uh, question and I will put it in context of, of Jews. So you already told us that you cannot change the, the, the agency, agency cannot change from one minute to the next one uh, about the objectives of the mission or uh, the general planning of the mission. But what if, uh, for instance, we are starting um, with Jews 10 years ago and this year there is a huge discovery that could change um, the design, not the design, but that yeah. could change um, the sensibility of the instrument, for instance, to measure the uh, plasma flow, for instance. So yeah. uh, can the agency, the people in charge, um, do some adjustment or do some changes or how, how can you manage yeah, yeah, these yeah. changes? No, it's, 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 uh... To build a spacecraft, to build an instrument, it, it's really a complex process. It uh, you need a lot of creativity, creativity, energy, uh, technology development. So it's a very complex uh, affair to do that. So once you build an instrument, you try to build the best possible for the mission, and this is the same for the spacecraft. And then you cannot change the design uh, in bit, uh, during the development phase. It's, it's too complex. What you can see is if, if you can find a, an easy improvement, of course, you, you make it. That happens regularly. If you, can, if you find a better material for such a part of the, of the instrument, or if you find that the material is not good enough, then you do another one that we can do uh, relatively easily, but you don't change fundamentally the, the design of, uh, of, of an instrument. What you can do if, if there is a new discovery once the mission is developed or once the mission is launched, then you can what you can do is you can adapt the the, the observations plan. For example, in the case of Juice, we plan to observe uh, Jupiter a little bit and then the moons. But for example, if there is a, a big new discovery on Jupiter, then we may change the planning and we we want to we we may observe a little bit more of Jupiter because uh, we have this new discovery. Or same for the moon. If we have a new discovery for Europa, we'll try to observe Europa a little bit more so that we can change a little bit the planning of the observation. But the design itself of the instrument, we will not change. It's too, uh, too complex. Okay. Yeah, right. And once uh, use uh, is in orbit, for how long uh, this mission will be working? So first we will, uh, and in your movie, there were some interesting, uh, in the movie, in the introduction, there were some interesting uh, animations that you can, you could see a little bit what happened. So we will be uh, orbiting Jupiter for, for two and a half years. And during that time, we will observe Jupiter and we'll do some flyby. So we'll go close to Europa, Ganymede, and also Callisto, a bit further away. And at the end of the mission, we'll even enter into orbit around this uh, Ganymede moon. moon. And all in all, it will take uh, four or five years of mission. So uh, the mission will last uh, four or five years, and then that will be the end of the of the mission. So it's a very limited mission, not like uh, the Mars missions. For the reason is that uh, Jupiter, there is a big magnetic field. There is a lot of energetic particles, something like like you and and Primoz, you know you know well, and you know that these particles they are very not very good for the for the spacecraft they can damage the electronics and the instruments so after four or five years uh, around jupiter we expect that the uh, the spacecraft and the instrument will not be working very very well because of this uh, what we call the radiation environment so we have a we have a limited mission of something four or five years i would say yeah okay um, i think that pretty much yeah. we'll have uh maybe one more question yeah, uh, if I mean, you see the time now we are yes. just uh, passing the the one hour and uh, it's it's late in europe so let's yeah, okay, uh, just okay. wrap it up <laughs> pretty much and then we can uh, uh, so I was, I was about to say that the uh, albert einstein said the time is relative and for me it felt like five minutes you know mm -hmm. uh it's been more than an hour uh maybe just to finish um uh, so what about uh, long-term uh, missions like long-term NASA is a project maybe just a few sentences on that what is uh, i know there is this voyage 2050 being drafted right now uh what is what uh, what is isa going to do and uh, during the following decades 
So yeah, so uh, so there will be uh, juice, of course, sent uh, launch next year. We have a mission around Mercury. Uh, sorry, around um, yes, to go to Mercury, which is called Bepi Colombo, that will arrive in 2025, 2026. Uh, we are also starting uh, the development of a mission to Venus uh, that will arrive in 2030 and will work until 2035, 36. So there will be a lot of new discoveries about uh, Venus, which is also quite interesting. Uh, in the in the, in area of astronomy, there will be a, a big uh, observatories which is being launched uh, in December, which is uh, James Webb. So mm -hmm. it's a very famous observatory between ESA mm -hmm. and NASA. So that uh, will I should be great, I think. <laughs> uh, then we are also building uh, or to soon um, a big observatory for X-ray X-ray mission, which is called Athena. We have also a, a project called LISA. It's very interesting. It will study the uh, gravitational wave. That's the new way of uh, of understanding the universe, the black holes, to check what uh, Einstein has done 100 years ago. So we have that. And then in the long term, we'll go back to. Um, to the icy moons of Jupiter or maybe of Saturn with a new mission, uh, but here uh, not before 10 or 20 years. We uh, it, it it takes a lot of time, so that's uh, plus some uh, some Mars missions always because we have also at ESA a, a good uh, Mars program and, and a lot of exoplanet mission as I said. So there is really a lot in all the fields uh, that hopefully will make the the scientific community happy and the, the general public interested by what we are doing. That's great. Uh, unfortunately, we have to finish. I, I thank you very much for joining us. I think it was a great uh, interview. It was extremely interesting. I got some messages from my friends also who uh, think this way. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, um, you know, when this all this uh, comes down, hopefully one day you can visit us and maybe we can... Sure, sure, sure. Uh, with uh, with can, pleasure, with pleasure. We can, give, we can give a talk here in Mexico. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for your invitation. And and uh, see you soon. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you, both of you, Oliver and Primoz. So now I will um, switch to Spanish just to wrap it up with the, with the audience. Uh, so, gracias por haber estado con nosotros en esta entrevista. Gracias por todas las interesantes preguntas que nos hicieron llegar para eh, hacerlas a nuestro a nuestro invitado del día de hoy, Olivier Vitase, agradecemos mucho su participación y eh, les recordamos también que eh, el ciclo de ciencias espaciales continúa, continúa eh, el resto del año, tenemos el próximo jueves 21 de octubre la siguiente edición, también con un invitado de la ESA, el doctor Philippe Escubet, con el tema eh, What do we know about the cluster mission? So, vamos a hablar eh, en este mismo eh, tipo de entrevista con el doctor Escubet sobre los secretos de esta misión, lo que eh, sabemos el día de hoy de, eh, de los nuevos resultados que se obtuvieron con esta misión. Eh, no me queda más, entonces, que volver a agradecer a toda la audiencia por habernos acompañado. Eh, en, podrán encontrar en el póster promocional nuestras redes sociales en Facebook, Ciencias Espaciales UNAM, en Twitter, Ciencias C Espaciales UNAM. También tenemos nuestro perfil en LinkedIn y en YouTube también podrán encontrar el video de esta plática. Eh, también en los, en los videos de la Facultad de Ciencias la podrán encontrar. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Olivier. Thank you very much, Primoz, and see you next time. Gracias. Bye. Hasta luego. Gracias. Bye bye. Hasta luego.